Today was test day at the gym, so yeah, I feel great. So that's why I'm going to be talking about the symmetries in space that give rise to conservation theorems on momentum. Space actually has two symmetries that give rise to these conservation theorems, and those symmetries are space being both homogeneous and isotropic. And what they mean essentially is that the laws of physics do not vary from place to place. But of course there is some technical difference between the terms. By space being homogeneous, I mean that you can take a closed mechanical system and displace it to another point in space, all other things about the system being exactly the same, then the laws of mechanics or the equations of motion governing the behavior of the system will remain the same. This obviously translates to the origin of space being arbitrary. And as far as isotropy is concerned, space being isotropic has something to do with rotations that we'll cover in the later half of this video. So let's say we have a closed system and we subject this closed system to an infinitesimal displacement dr. So all the position vectors of the particles, that is ri, get shifted to ri plus dr, and we haven't altered anything else in the system. And of course, this is equivalent to a shift in the origin. Okay, so what does this shift in position vectors mean for the Lagrangian? Well, we just argued that such a displacement does not alter the equations of motion governing the behavior of the mechanical system, so that means there will be no change in the form of the Lagrangian. Now, let me just expand on this. This implies that partial L by partial Ri dot dr plus partial L by partial V, oh, terribly, sorry about that, partial Vi dot dvi equals zero, and this is, of course, summed over all the particles. Bear in mind that we're using dot products because we saw from the previous videos that when you differentiate the scalar field with respect to uh, the position vector, the velocity vector, any vector that is, then you get a vector valued function. Okay, cool. But hold up. We did not alter the velocities in any manner. We just altered the position vectors. So this thing here is zero. So this implies that factoring out dr, which is common to all the position vectors involved, we have the sum from i equals uh, 1, wait a second, i equals 1 to n of partial l by partial ri being equal to 0. And because this equation is valid for any arbitrary displacement dr, the only way for it to make sense is that the sum from i equals 1 to n of partial l by partial ri equals 0 as well. Okay, cool, but what does this equation even mean? Recall that the Lagrangian is the difference between the system's total kinetic and total potential energies. And we know that u for a closed system is a function of the coordinates or position vectors. And the kinetic energy, in the usual Cartesian sense that we're using, can be written as a sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 half of mi vi squared. And we know even in the, in the case of generalized coordinates, this is a quadratic function in the velocities. Okay. So this implies that partial L, partial ri, negative partial u by partial ri, right? Wait, terribly sorry about that. Okay, so this thing here means the force on the ith particle. So this equation means that the sum of forces on the system is zero, but we already knew that because we were considering a closed system. So we're gonna have to translate this equation a bit to introduce or to uncover some spicier findings. And how exactly are we going to do that? Well, let's invoke the Lagrangian equations. So we know that partial L by partial Ri minus d by dt of partial L by partial Vi equals zero. And of course, this can be written in this manner as well. So let me just pop this relation into the equation written in blue but boxed in orange. 
So this implies that the time derivative of the sum from i equals 1, oh, again, terribly sorry about that, from i equals 1 to n of partial L by partial V equals 0. And that means this quantity, the sum from 1 to n of partial L by partial VI is, in fact, some constant. But what exactly is this constant? Well, partial L by partial V is, of course, going to be equal to partial T by partial V, right? Because the potential function is independent of velocities in this case. So this thing here equals a constant. And what happens when you differentiate the total kinetic energy with respect to any one velocity? Let's see what happens. We have half of the sum over k, because we have the total kinetic energy here, of one half of mk vk squared. So on differentiating, we have the sum over k of one half of mk times partial vk squared by partial vi. So this thing here should be equal to twice the velocity vector v sub i. So that means on the right-hand side, we have the sum from k equals, no wait, it should be for, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Wait, it is the, <laughs> terribly sorry about that, a bit of a uh, math glitch followed by a language glitch where I forgot exactly what I wanted to say. Anyway, so this thing over here equals one half of mi times 2vi, the 2s cancel out, we're left with mi vi, and that means what we have is the sum from i equals 1 to n of mi vi being equal to a constant, and this thing here we know and love is the total momentum of the system. So it's the homogeneous nature of space that leads to the conservation of momentum for closed systems. A nice takeaway from this analysis is a way to translate the Lagrangian equations of motion in terms of some generalized momenta and forces. What I mean is we just saw that the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to a velocity, and now I'm writing this as a generalized velocity, equals a generalized momentum. Right, and we just saw that partial L by partial QI, uh, partial QI equals the time derivative of this thing. So this equals the time derivative of the generalized momenta. So this thing over here on the left-hand side can be channeled into a generalized force. So we have a generalized force on the ith particle being equal to the time rate of change of its generalized momentum. I keep saying generalized momentum because it's possible that the quantity on the right-hand side, the pi, may not have the dimensions of linear momentum. For example, if I talk about polar coordinates with two degrees of freedom, in that case, we have partial L by partial phi being equal to p phi, and this would be the angular momentum. And of course, that means the generalized force that we're talking about would be the moment or torque experienced by the ith particle. Now that we understand the consequences of space being homogeneous, we should also look to space being isotropic. What do I mean by that? Well, space being isotropic means that if you take a closed system and you rotate it about some axis, what I'm trying to say is take each particle and rotate it by the same angle about some axis, and of course, what I'm saying is equivalent to a rotation of the coordinate system, then the form of the Lagrangian will not change. And that makes perfect sense as well, because again, the laws of physics do not vary from place to place in space. Okay, but one thing that does vary with rotations is vectors. The form of a vector will change. So if I rotate the system by an angle d phi and I define the direction of this vector d phi to be along the axis of rotation, then the position vectors change according to dr being equal to d phi cross r. Okay, just give me a minute. And this is true for all the particles. Similarly, the velocity vectors also change according to the same rule. Okay, great. Now, let's 
translate all of this into the differential of the Lagrangian. So dL being equal to zero implies that the sun, oh wait, terribly sorry about that, the sun over all the particles of partial L by partial R dot dR plus partial L by partial V dot dV equals zero. Now expanding dr and dv using these forms we've written out above, this implies that the sum over i of partial L by partial ri uh, dot d phi cross r plus partial L by partial vi dot d phi cross v equals zero. Okay, cool. Now, what exactly was this thing again? Partial L by partial Ri? This was in fact the force on the ith particle, which is in fact the time derivative of the momentum vector. So I'm writing this as P dot I. So this implies that the sum from I equals one to N of P dot I dot D phi cross R, forgot the index over there, plus uh, what exactly was this thing? This thing was the momentum vector itself. So we have pi dot d phi cross bi all equal to zero. So factoring out a d phi term over here, this implies that d phi dot the sum from i equals one to n of pi dot cross ri, again, something wrong with the i's, plus pi cross vi all equals zero. And because this is valid for arbitrary d phi, this means that it's actually the sum that's gonna be zero. And if you look closely at the sum and recall that vi is of course r dot i, so this implies that what we have in the sum is actually just a time derivative expanded using the power rule. So we have the time derivative of pi cross ri. And again, because the derivative is zero, and this implies that the sum over i from one to n of pi cross ri is a constant in time. And we actually rearrange the r and the position vector and the momentum vectors and the cross product. That does introduce a negative sign, but again, it's a constant. That's what matters. It's a constant. And that negative sign never really shows any trouble anyway. We have experience from physics anyway. So it's cool. This thing over here is a constant. So this implies that if we call this constant, let's say m, and we know that the sum on the left-hand side is the angular momentum. So angular momentum is conserved for closed systems. That's what we conclude from the isotropy of space. And one thing I'd like to highlight over here uh, is because the definition of total angular momentum has this position vector in it, that means the value of m is dependent on the choice of origin. However, whenever you choose an origin, it's going to be conserved. That's what matters. And it's because of this behavior that once you change the origin, the vector changes. That's why angular momentum is called a pseudo vector rather than an actual vector. An actual vector is a rank one tensor that doesn't change with a change in coordinates. Anyway, that's pretty much it. So in the last video, we covered the symmetry in time that led to the conservation of energy. And here we talked about symmetries in space that led to momentum conservation. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.